What's up, fine people? Glad that you are here. Maybe uh, the most important episode that I've ever done today, this conversation I have with my friend Brendan Bradley. Uh, Brendan is an actor. I'm going to get into it in just a minute, but I think it was just an important conversation for creative people to hear. Uh, Brendan said a lot of insightful and vulnerable, cool things about being in the creative industry. Obviously, he's in like film and TV uh, commercials, things like that as an actor, but he also does a lot of voiceover work. He also does a lot of performance uh, capture and uh, just a lot of cool stuff. I can't wait to get into it. Wherever you're at, make sure that you're subscribed uh, so you get notified of all the new episodes and whatnot. And also make sure to follow at MyFi Podcast on social media. You can also follow me at Lee T. Baker. And uh, yeah, let's let's get into it. Yes, dude, this, I'm so stoked. This was a great conversation. And I'll tell you right up front, we had a lot of technical difficulties. It wasn't anybody's fault. It's just, you know, technology. And part of our conversation was about uh, embracing technology or being afraid of technology or whatever in the creative industry. And my the, trying to capture this podcast with Brendan today made me not afraid of technology, at least for today, because, uh, uh, the, you know, uh, we, just had some, we just had some issues. We overcame. We put it together, I spliced it together because it's important conversation we had about all sorts of things, uh, dealing with social media, uh, his journey into acting, uh, going through the pandemic, some re- like pushing the lines technologically with some things he's doing with VR. We had a great conversation. Uh, Brendan's been on over 100, maybe, I don't know, 100, 150 TV shows, commercials, all sorts of stuff. Um, I met Brendan at a, a little party um, or for like a cast crew, fan, friends and family sort of thing, um, for a film that he had made uh, a few years ago, actually. And uh, it was just like a hang, and we kind of got to know each other and uh, really hit it off just talking about creativity and investing in creative people, which he does a lot of. And he uh, subsequently um, was on uh, the, the tail end of being a uh, lot captain for SAG after during the Reiner strike and following him on social media was so inspiring and informative because obviously I don't, I don't know anything about that industry really, but it was just a great, um, glimpse into, uh, his heart for people and caring about the creative community around him. Um, so I want to make sure that, um, you, you listen to the whole episode cause it's really great, but make sure that you follow Brendan a Bradley on social media at Brendan a Bradley. Uh, he has been posting in a little bit and we get into that as to why and all that's an awesome part of the conversation. Um, but there's a lot of reels and things up from his days as a lot captain, uh, for SAG after during the, um, writer strike uh this past year and go check out that stuff it's super informative but just it's so cool to see uh an industry kind of come alongside of each other and just support each other and, and, and that was a cool experience and i learned a lot from his his post as well uh yeah he is a super generous kind individual about the people around him and i think you're going to have a blast in this conversation uh, i want to tell you his website is brendanabradley.com uh, like I said, he's at Brendan A. Bradley on all the socials. We talk about a few things that he's got coming up, um, some shows, hopefully one that's going to be on tour near you very soon. So I hope you enjoy this conversation I had with my friend, Brendan Bradley. Brendan, what's up, dude? What's up? How you it's, doing? I'm doing good. It's good to see you, man. It's been a minute. It's been more than a minute. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it's been many minutes. <laughs> many minutes. Many minutes. Uh, yeah, dude, it was so good to meet you. A little little friends and family kind of gathering party thing we had uh, a couple months ago and just really hit it off. I appreciate you jumping on the show. I don't, I don't get to talk to a lot of people, you know, actors, actresses, people in the film world. So this is super interesting to me. Well, I'm honored to get to chat because like you give such a spotlight to so much creativity and the context that we met is truly with no fluff, uh, the greatest group of independent filmmakers and artists I've ever worked with, uh, our mutual, mutual friends, Brandon and Nick uh, from Whitestone Pictures. Um, and they've got this film, The Daylong Brothers, that is a true indie film, not something that most people can say anymore. They have built this thing from the ground up over five years and- yep they have encountered the exact same problems that every independent filmmaker encounters in this day and age that we can get into uh, down in the interview. But I'm so proud of them that basically a couple years into the post-production process, they said, you know what? We owe our 
team, our friends, our family, a glimpse at this thing because it doesn't have distribution. It doesn't have a way to get seen yet. And yeah. they worked really hard on it. And so we want to share it with them. And again, it's that combination of incredible artistry meets incredible culture. Like yep. good, good people. And that's what we need is good people making good art. And so I'm excited to get to connect with you about more good people making good art. Yeah, totally, dude. I, I was telling you just a minute ago before we started, when I talk film, uh, because I work in the music industry, I feel like I only have like eight crayons. And there's something exciting to me about that because when you, whatever industry you work in, it can get so complex. Um, I enjoy like moving over to something. And sometimes as a musician, I'll like try to draw or paint, which I'm terrible at. But because the expectation's not there, it's not my world, quote unquote, yes. I have, I'm a little more free. And uh, I don't know, there's, there's a vulnerability and a humility that comes with it that I think is cool. So I enjoy talking to people from other creative disciplines who have so much experience. You've been in over a hundred and something movies, TV shows, commercials, all this sort of stuff. You do um, the uh, performance stuff, which is something I definitely want to get into. I saw the, the Marvel... Um, Oh, I'm oh the, say, the video, the video, the video games game. and performance yeah, capture. Yeah, yeah. The performance capture stuff. I don't even know the words, bro. That that's how much I know. Uh, but the Marvel was it a uh, Rising Suns or Midnight Midnight Suns? They did Marvel's Midnight Suns, and then I did Resident Evil Village. Resident huge video games for all that sort of stuff. Yeah. The voiceover stuff, um, being a, ca- a lot captain for the Reiner during the Reiner strike uh, for SAG after and all that. And I, I want to get into all of that. Here's what's exciting to me. I have no idea how anybody even gets into like acting. My daughter's in theater in her middle school right now, and she's uh-huh. playing Janice and Mean Girls uh, this spring nice. in the musical. And so this is my first experience like as a parent with a kid in theater. But otherwise, I just have no idea. Were you like in theater as a kid, or how did you get into this You know, at all? Yes, I was not Janice and Mean Girls, but I was pretty close. I, uh, Damien, Damien I grew, and me. I grew up in North Carolina, uh, Durham, North Carolina. Nice. Um, and the nearest theater uh, was a community theater uh, called Raleigh Little Theater in Raleigh, which is the neighboring town about an hour away. Oh, wow. And I auditioned with maybe the worst Shakespeare monologue anyone has ever seen in their life. What, what play was and, it? Uh, it was called The Clumsy Custard Horror Show and Ice Cream Cone Review. <laughs> Say that five times fast. Yeah. It was a it was a kid show and it's that classic thing where it's like there's audience participation, it's in the round. I'm playing this very dumb superhero. Um, and I like come out and they're like, the monster's behind you, and I look over the wrong shoulder and they're like, No, like the other shoulder. Like and that I went straight from that to being cast at that same theater in Master Herald and the Boys, which is a three-hander about apartheid in South Africa. So were there creative people like in your family or when did you get into the theater thing? Did you just go, oh, hey, mom and dad, I'm interested in something like this or were one of your siblings into it or like how did you even get into the community theater in the first place? Yeah, so my family is not really artistic at all. I come from like academics and teachers and doctors and my brother's really into business at like Amazon Web Services. Um, I, I'm kind of like the weird art kid uh, in the group. <laughs> Well, you got some and, of the smart stuff too with all the VR and the technology and stuff you had to carry. That's some of giving that. me a lot of credit. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know how to plug something in. Um, I have a ninth crayon. That's not a lot <laughs> to, to go with here. Yeah. Um, Touche. But I, uh, I specifically, I was not a very good. Uh, I was not a social kid. I was not connected to my community. I couldn't. I couldn't really make a lot of friends. I did not thrive in school. Um, I was really struggling, and my mom kept, bless her, trying to find different communities to plug me into. To be like, you'll find friends here. Yeah. Um, and at one point, she saw auditions for that child theater play and dropped me off at a community theater, and I auditioned, um, and I don't know that she foresaw how much I would take to it because it then became essentially my entire identity because I'd never had anything capture me that much and also that responded to me that much, that there was a place for me inside of it. And ironically, the motivation behind falling in love with theater and what I loved about learning an accent or learning a dance or learning text or like really researching a character or the world they came from 
made me naturally more curious about my studies. And then the desire to go to school mm. for theater meant that my like, my like, you know, eight, you know, eighth grade, ninth grade, 10th grade, like, uh Oh, this guy might not make it like <laughs> pulled out, like hard pulled up my GPA, yeah. my, my performance, my desire to learn my passion, my, my serotonin levels, mm. uh, my, my sense of community and like advocacy for people at, at school with me and, and building friends and relationships. Yeah. Um, and I think in some ways you could, you could say non-dramatically that, theater saved my life. Mm. Man, you know, I've seen that a lot of times, even with my own kids, my son's in the band at his high school. And as soon as he like figured that out and kind of got into that, there was a corner that he just turned and it's like, yeah, you know, his, his mentality and his positivity. And, you know, it was just like, now it's like his thing. And like, it's like he lives and breathes it, you know, and there's so much to that. I think that's why people are so big. People who have experienced it, like yourself, me, my kids, and, uh, you know, a litany of other people are so big on like the arts programs, like being in communities and schools and, you know, all that sort of stuff. We, a lot of times the health of a kid in history class or literature class or science class is related to them, like figuring out how to process who they are and, and emotions and all those sorts of things in, you know, art classes. Uh, do you get, do you get to do any work like that now? I mean, I know that that's always, seems like it's meant a lot to you. Do you get to do anything in schools or theater schools or anything like that? So I, I dabble around a lot of things. So when I have good years that I can actually like afford to take off lots of time for volunteering, um, yeah. I've worked with, um, a program called the young filmmakers that specifically goes into low income schools and, and helps them basically use iPads to make their first film. Uh, which oh, is wow. really cool, or write their first script. Um, I have a lab at New York University's Tisch School of the Arts for integrating new technologies into live oh performance and literally like putting experts in technology in the hands of students. Um, and then I do Zooms like this at very weird hours at schools all over the world, um, often answering questions, everything from how do I get my first agent and break into acting to literally just talking about creativity and finding your voice and, and producing a project from the ground up. Yeah, I was when we met um, and I started following you on social media and everything. I went back and was looking, you know, watching tons of stuff. Um, it was, you know, roundabout towards the end, I think, of, of the uh, Reiner strike that happened this last fall. You had invested so much time and I learned so much from just watching those posts all the time. It's not inherently my world. But as songwriters and producers, we're looking to the film world a lot of times to go, why can't we get this right? <laughs> you know, because well, it seems like and you guys congratulations are to the music industry for just having secured some protections. It's coming along. It's coming along. Actually, a new act was introduced yesterday in a Congress. It's like a big deal. The Living Wage Act for musicians is going to be a big deal if it, if it uh, gets some traction. But I mean, I think we're taking a page from that. I say all that to say, I was just blown away by your generosity and how much you give away to the creative community and the, the film community and all that. Uh, nobody was making you, at least not to my knowledge, <laughs> post all that information. Uh, on on Instagram or whatever it was and and just sharing like educating people not not just people like me who it you know doesn't have an immediate effect on but like your peers in the acting industry like there's no competition it seems like I just want to hear a little bit about your heart behind all of that and what drew you to be a leader in that organization and in the acting community sure I mean when I first moved to Los Angeles the first time uh, it was in the middle of the first writer strike in 0708. Um, and that's how I made my first community and my first network in Los Angeles was getting to be on those front lines, showing up for them and supporting them. And so mm -hmm. when they went on strike in May of last year, the very first day I was in the car and I was out there outside of Warner Brothers uh, in solidarity um, yeah. because that's what you do. Um, all of this, I loved your crayon analogy right at the beginning because I, when I look at like a pack of crayons and when you see kids write, you draw with crayons, it's collaborative. Every you know, someone's got the red and someone's got the blue, and you're you're scribbling. And you're like, oh, can I borrow the green real fast? Yeah. And that's what it is, honestly, to make art. I yeah. think art always has a collaborative element, even the more solo artistic practices that are 
more personal and more isolated, the audience is, you're in dialogue with that audience. It's meant to be a gift that is received and responded to. Yeah. Um, and that dialogue loop um, isn't complete until you have another, other people. Um, and that's that's what I think, honestly, is so beautiful about creativity and art in general is that it's human and it connects all of us. It inherently connects. Mm-hmm. Um it doesn't always feel that way at 3 a.m. when you're like fixing some sort of like music stem or some edit of something, but ultimately it is there to connect us. And so I was out there on the line and very quickly when I was there multiple days in a row, I started meeting a couple of these writer captains. They have this captain system built in. And one of them asked me, does SAG have a captain system? And I was like, you know, I I, I don't know. I should probably ask somebody. Yeah. And lo and behold, we had not taken a major labor action in 40 years. So we oh, had wow. no plan, no schedule, no infrastructure, no hierarchy, nothing. And so thankfully, all because of the writers, we were kind of assigned. There was a small group of us that got tapped by existing captains. They're like, who are some of the actors that have been out there with you that might know what the heck's going on? Yeah. And then we got assigned a lots all over the country to then kind of be leaders on day one by like learning from how is the writer's guild scheduling their donations and their members and how are they organizing traffic and just essentially the the mentorship of learning from them how to lead so that then we could train up others. Yeah. And so I was there the very first day of the SAG after strike um, at the Paramount lot where I was assigned. It's very far away from where I live. And so I was like, you know, I'll go for the first week to be a team player and then I'll ask to be moved closer <laughs> to where I live. And I trauma bonded with everybody there mm-hmm. because it was a record heat wave and we were not prepared and we didn't really have the organization yet. And there were fewer of us volunteers than there were gates at Paramount to oh. actually like serve. So we were stretched completely thin. Um, and so after that first week, it was like, okay, this is my new home. I'm going to come here every single day. Um, and this is what we're doing. And we needed to get the word out for more volunteers to come. And so my very first video or social post about the strike was a bingo card that I made of all the different lots in Los Angeles. And I was like, Hey, come get your selfie at each lot and oh. fill out your bingo card. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, and I then made a video kind of speaking to the importance of that, of like, this is why this matters. And honestly, what we need is you to come volunteer. So please, if you can, please volunteer. We have shifts available. And that post using, you know, these are kind of classic, you know, hooks and repetition and social media engagement tools and techniques that I've used for releasing my album, releasing films, you know, trying to get hired. Yeah. Yeah. It has never been very successful when it has been self-serving. But the (laughs) moment I was using these great successful social media tools in service of of something larger than myself, of course, that's when it goes viral. Yeah, man. Um, (laughs) So so then those posts were starting to connect with people and the natural educator within myself coming from educators, I saw the opportunity to kind of correct some messaging that was getting regurgitated by people who were very well-meaning, but were just repeating something that a newscaster said. Sure. That wasn't actually relevant to the contract negotiations. Yeah. Um, And so I basically took a talking point every single day, found an anecdote from my own career, and made a video around it. Hmm. Dude, I'm telling you, I learned a ton. Like I said earlier, I'm just, it's not my industry, so I don't, I'm very elementary in my understanding of of how it works, but to see you out there and educating yourself, not just going, Hey, I know all this stuff, which we see on the internet all the time. There's people like, let me tell you what right. I know, but you going, Hey, I'm about to sit down and read this whole document. Like I remember when you did the, you read it and recorded it so people could listen yeah. to the whole contract. Like yeah. guys, if you're listening and you don't know like how this works, I, I, I just feel like people have this misconception. Um, and it happens in the music industry too, but there's a misconception where there's like, there's these rich, successful actors, and then there's like the struggling people who like, you know, have nothing. And then everybody forgets there's a, I'm going to say this may be a terrible term for it, but like a middle class of acting and musicianship and everything you called, you use the term jobber, uh, on, on your post. And I thought that was like, it, it feels like I do this every day. It's more of a, a blue collar, like work ethic sort of thing behind it. And I don't know that everybody understands that you have to not only like um, 
have that mentality, but you have to be able to equip yourself with the knowledge of like contracts and the business side of things and all. And it's the same in the music industry. And so what you did, I'm sure, because if the people who do this in my industry, I'm so grateful for it. I message them all the time. Uh, I don't know that anybody else read the whole contract so that actors and actresses and writers and, and people in the industry could just listen to it. So I, I just thought that was amazing. Uh, I actually listened to like a little bit of it and w- just to go like, this is amazing that somebody would invest in this. And so I feel like good things should have come from that for you. Have you met like cool people and like cool stuff happened from volunteering uh, those days that you did and doing everything that you did during the strike? I think there's definitely, I earned a sense of community, which is what I was craving. Sure. Um, so I got a, a real community of people that were out there every single day or every single week. There's then an online community of people who uh, were kind of like sometimes correcting and educating me or giving me feedback on my post or just connecting with me in DMs um, that I feel like I gained. I, I'm a Southern boy. So uh, at the end of the strike, I hand wrote a letter to every single person that I met on the line frequently. Yeah. Um, um, at, which was also a little weird. Cause I like asked my manager, Hey, here's a list of like celebrities that I want to send a thank you card to, which I know is weird, but like, I'm not trying to be weird about this. This is just my culture. Sure. And I think that that is an investment. And I think we see this as, spe- as specifically in creativity is that, we love the myth of overnight success, mm-hmm. but especially in things like music or theater, or even film, your next job isn't next month, right? The idea is that you play a gig in Cleveland and it might be a terrible gig and everything went wrong and maybe you lost a little money on it because someone screwed you out of you know something or a reimbursement or something. But three years later, somebody who was at that show is the reason you get the gig, the yeah. one that like makes it all worth it and makes up for it. Absolutely. And so I see this as when the strikes hit, for me personally, I overfunction as a human. Um, it's how I find purpose. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that like, word. I, I, I'm a lot and I have to be a lot because otherwise the voices creep in and no one wants that Yeah, because <laughs> um, they're very mean. <laughs> um, <laughs> I feel you. <laughs> but I, I saw this as this was my decision to double down on my community. I'm all in mm-hmm. on Los Angeles. I am choosing to live and work in Los Angeles, in this community, support these small businesses, connect with these humans, you know, invest in this society and culture. Um, And that means going all in on that. And so the dividends of that may not pay out for a decade, Hmm. but the goal for me was to really choose to invest in LA, in my union and in my fellow entertainment community. Bro, that's amazing. I don't... I can tell you, like, I just jumped into uh, music and stuff full time a couple of years ago and left a day job and all that sort of stuff. And the amount of people that I could name that I wouldn't have made it a day, you know, without a handful of people that that their encouragement, their investment, the gear they gave me, like just, you know, all sorts of stuff. And then, you know, it is, it's, it's, uh, it's the kind of person you are, the generosity and kindness and people, you have to be good at what you do. That's a given, but there's a lot of people who are good at what they do, who are just not cool people to be around. And so much of it is just who you are, you know? Absolutely. Well, and I think I'll go a step further is I think that early in our career or our understanding of creativity, if we're like an audience member, for example, like watching a movie we're watching all the actors in the same conditions. Like we're seeing final product all the time. Mm -hmm. And so we get to make this determination of like, who's quote unquote better. Mm. But I remember the pivot when I started watching movies and realizing they're giving that performance on a day when the camera wasn't working or they're behind schedule and they only get one take, like, to act in spite of the conditions is the craft, right? To go on and give a great show and play, you know, you got all those guitars up there. They all sound different and you know that, but you know that because you've put in that time and you're then going to not make that the problem of the audience that they don't know the difference in the sound and what impact you're trying to give them. And so I think that in a lot of ways there is the inherent 
ability and craft and skill, but there's also there's human elements that make people better in alignment for different components of this job. Like, mm-hmm. I don't know. I've never toured before. I don't know what I'd be like on the road. I know that you can drop me off in a weird location. I don't live and I can survive. Like I can find rhythm and productivity and positivity for month long, two month long jobs um, and build quick connections and family and conduct myself professionally under duress. Mm. But I don't know what it's like to like get up in the morning, drive, do a show that night, get some, get some shut eye and get up and do it again. Like, I don't know if I'm actually designed to do that. And there are people who are. Yeah. And to look at us as the same and judge our talent the same, I think is a misnomer um, in a lot of ways because it is about who you are. Yeah. There's certain things that you're just geared to be able to do. Um, and that's where I also see like there's people who are better in alignment with recording music or composing, for example, music that's never going to be performed live versus performing music live versus people who are going to do theater versus film versus television versus web content commercials. Like those are all different skills. They aren't baby versions of each other. It's not yeah. like, oh, you do commercials. So you're less than a movie star. Yeah, man. Like, I know a guy who does like f- six commercials a year and his house is very nice. <laughs> like, frankly, that's not a bad life. And he's very yeah. good at what he does. Yeah. But well, people don't realize uh, um, uh, Barry Manilow, you know, who had a great career, may not be everybody's cup of tea, you know, but uh, he wrote like jingles for McDonald's and Band-Aid and yeah. like Band-Aid stuck on me. It was Barry Manilow. Like, all, I mean, just huge things. And, you know, you saying that makes me think like there used to be a, a template that you kind of would follow in the music industry. And I'm, maybe it was similar in the in the film industry or TV industry or whatever. But now it just seems like finding the unique thing that you do. And that that was one thing is I followed you with all of the VR stuff, all of the performance capture stuff. There seems to be two types of creative people right now. Um, at least that's how my conversations go. And it doesn't matter the industry you're in, whether you're a writer or a, a blogger or a videographer or a photographer, musician, whatever you do. There are people who are like scared of the future and they're like, you know, this is how Terminator started, you know, don't, don't do it. And then there's people on the other side of the coin, which I would put you in that are like, let's figure out how this works for us. Let's negotiate. Let's, let's do all the business side of things, but also let's do the creative side of things. Let's get into this, like the Jettison VR experience that you did and, and, uh, you know, some other stuff that you're working on. What, I don't even really know what to ask. Cause I'm, I'm, kind of in awe of it you're that kind of person it seems where you're embracing it how are you not afraid of it and what excites you about it i guess is what i want to ask well i think i'm glad that my external messaging has made you believe that i'm not afraid of it because (laughs) i because what i want to be is optimistic Mm. with anything um especially when it comes to technology i'm an elder millennial Basically, every five years of my existence, some crazy new thing has come along that has changed the very way we do everything. Yeah. Um, You know, and like, I love the question. People are always like, you know, what, what, what's the first CD you bought? And I'm like, bro, what's the first tape and vinyl I bought? Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. The, the, like I had to keep language. restarting my entire music library yeah. several times as a kid. <laughs> that's unfair. Like, um, but so I think that what that's made me is adaptable, which I think is the number one trait you can have, no matter what you want to do with your life mm. is to, be willing to accept that things will change. Now, I don't think it's fair or reasonable. And where I do draw a line is the culture of technology that is the like adapt or die. Yeah. Um, Because I think that first that's callous and it's unnecessary. But second, there's a lot of people that don't own a smartphone. Yeah. There's a lot of people who aren't on the internet, who aren't on social media. Um, so to say that this is a mandate that just because something new and shiny comes along, society has to get out of the way and accept it. I don't think that that's fair. I think the burden should be on the technology to prove itself useful mm. to its users. Yeah. That's, it's a product. It, it should be 
productive. Um, and so what I always look for with the new technologies is I consider myself a scrappy storyteller where I'm going to use whatever tools or resources and people are available to me to create work that could not have existed and connect with audiences that would not have existed previously. Mm. And that's everything from like producing my first plays as a teenager because my high school didn't have an auditorium <laughs> to getting into early web development and video hosting because we were producing plays in like 60 seat theaters and we could get more people to watch it online than we could get in the actual theater um, to then getting into virtual reality and realizing I hated Zoom. I hated that we all got isolated from each other during the pandemic. And the fact that through a video game system, I could in real time share an open world space and co-create a narrative with unlimited audience members. Yeah. To me, it's finding how the technology serves us, not the other way around. And I think that when we take the artist position and the human position, technology is always a tool. When we take the business position and the technical like Silicon Valley position, it's a culture. Hmm. And it's them trying to raise venture capital and it's them trying to like redefine legislation. Like it, it's, that's a whole other world that has really nothing to do with the inherent technology or tool that is very compelling. Yeah. And so to me, it's always dividing it up between, I love the tools. I have great apprehension for the culture. Yeah. It's, it's something the way that you understand this says something about the way you've diversified yourself. And the scary thing, the people who are the on the other side of the coin who are a little bit fearful, who are like, no, this, we can't do anything with AI or whatever. I think it's just you, you have to diversify yourself as a creative person. Like I can't just produce music. I have to write a little, I have to do a little session work. I have to kind of be an artist as well. You know, even session work wise, I do some front end work and pop and hip hop where I do some session work and like singer songwriter country folk music. Like it's all so different and you kind of have to be able to, the, when you said adapt earlier, I think that's what creates a career being famous and super rich and all this sort of stuff is just, man, it's like playing in the NBA. It's just so few people make it there, but you can build a career doing something that you love if you're willing to work you know, and do the right. thing. And that seems to be right. your approach to it too. What would you tell somebody who's like 19 years old, 18, 19 years old right now, high school, getting out of high school, going into college. I want to be, you know, an actor, actress, uh, screenwriter, wh whatever it could be in, in your industry. What's something that you would share with them to encourage them that it's possible? Because I've had a lot of conversations with younger creatives where they're like, I just don't know, you know, I, I think it's what I would say that is a constant, you know, my partner and I use this theme all the time of do the thing, make the thing, hmm. whatever it is, just do it, just start making it. Um, because I think a lot of people hold themselves back because, well, it won't be good enough or it won't be what I think it could be, or I don't have the budget. You, you're never going to have the resources that you want. Hmm. You're, you're just not. If you, if you watched a panel with, Steven Spielberg, and you asked him, you know, what what more did you want for the latest, you know, Indiana Jones movie? He would tell you more money. Like we didn't have enough budget. Like what, they're always going to be at the edge of their resources. They just have access to different resources. Yeah. But when it comes to resources, I also like to say that money is not the thing. Money is the thing that buys the thing. And so Sometimes, like you were saying, when you first went out and pivoted full time to music, people let you borrow gear mm -hmm. because what you needed wasn't money. It was gear. Mm -hmm. You were going to get money to buy the gear or you could just get the gear. Yeah. And so there's a lot of ways where collaboration and partnership with like minded individuals can actually help elevate everybody to start making work that starts to establish your path towards a career. Mm -hmm. And by that token, I'm very guilty of the fact that I kind of became a one man band for a little while. And again, that gets away from the real artistry and the real point of the career. Mm -hmm. Right now, if you want to be an actor, somewhere in your zip code is someone who wants to be a writer, yeah. someone who wants to be a director, someone who wants to be a cinematographer. Yeah. By engaging them and almost giving them permission to succeed or fail with you, 
ultimately builds something bigger than all of you combined and puts all of you on your way to start doing that thing, yeah. making that thing, whatever it is. Yeah, man, that's amazing. Uh, I want the next generation of creative people to be excited about what they, the potential of what all this is. One thing I've loved about social media, I mean, I'm, I'm in my mid forties and pivoting to a new career is interesting at, at my age, especially in creative, in the creative world. But I feel like social media has kind of destroyed a little bit of that ageism. I've had that conversation a lot, that there's a lot of open doors if you want to do the work and, you know, want to be creative. Um, it looks like social media has opened doors for you too, but also, you know, in the, from the strike and people that you've connected with and things like that. Um, but I know for a lot of people, it's not something they want to do. Like you mentioned earlier, there's a lot of people who are just not on social media. Um, and I guess what I'm asking now is like, what do you feel like is necessity and what do you feel like is pushed on, on people if they want to build a career, not, not the top tier famous, you know, Tom Cruise level of like, actor, actress yeah. play, if you want to build a career, what do you feel like is necessary for you to engage in as a creative person? Well, I think that a career can look like a lot of different things. And I, I, I like that you referenced Tom Cruise because I think that we only have the examples typically publicly of a Tom Cruise. Mm -hmm. And what social media has done is introduce us to a lot of different paths and a lot of different ways that success can look. Um, which is great. Like there are people who just straight up like make cooking vlogs and they make like six figures yeah. and I don't totally understand how they do it, but they do it. And yeah. that's cool. Um, I think that we always need to be mindful of there's very well intentioned advice that we get um, from at, I don't know how to say this in, a, in the most positive, pleasant way, but I think <laughs> that everyone has an opinion Everyone's got like feedback. Everybody's got like advice that they want to give you. And what I would suggest is all of that advice is coming from their own path and their own worldview, yeah. which is very helpful, but is also theirs. Yep. It's not yours. So for them to give it to you, there needs to be a transaction taking place. They need to be giving you something. Yeah. So when I hear people like we see casting directors and producers and you know, agents and stuff all the time say, you got to be making your own work. You got to be making your own work. Well, if they're going to help you get into film festivals and get it put in front of the right people and help shop it around once you make it, cool. That's awesome. They want to go on this journey with you. But if they're just picking up a stick and throwing it for you to go fetch over there so that you'll stop asking them about an audition, oh. that's that's not a genuine transaction taking place. And so... I think when we hear about like, you got to be on social media, you got to be on social media for some people. Yeah. Like social media, for example, is incredibly detrimental to my mental health. Mm. I decline very quickly when I'm posting every single day, like I did on the strike line. In fact, I have not really posted since the strike ended mm. because I needed a, a purge and my algorithm is completely destroyed. <laughs> I will have to start over from the beginning. There's a lot of people telling me that I like, I screwed it all up. I did it wrong. I needed to keep on making videos, but I couldn't Yeah, like, that served a specific purpose. And when it was done, I needed to be done. And I think social media is designed to make the product of social media more relevant and more important to sell ads. Mm -hmm. So you then need to be a beneficiary of that transaction. It's, it, it's the same good versus bad advice. Yeah. The bad advice is, we well, are just supposed to be on social media because then you'll get discovered. The good advice is, Here's how you succeed on social media to build a certain audience, to monetize it a certain way, to have supplemental income. Mm -hmm. Cool. Or here's how to put your portfolio on social media one time as a dormant account that someone can then go find you and hire you for the thing that you actually want to be doing. Yeah. Um, but there's an actor, and I'm forgetting his name from the West Wing, uh, who specifically said, you can know seven people and have a career. Hmm. And the idea being that he basically knew a handful of casting directors, writers, and directors who liked working with him and gave him a day here, a week there, a movie there, and he built a career out of it. He didn't need to go 
meet a bunch of other people or network or go to party. He's, you know, he wasn't going to go to parties and schmooze. That's not who he was. Yeah. Um, this is before social media, but he didn't have a PR firm behind him or a big agent behind him. So I think that when it comes to what do you need, you need people who want to work with you in whatever capacity that is, either on the ground, sl- roll the sleeves, making, and that's, we see that with bands. We see that with early independent filmmaking. Yeah. Um, you know, we see it, it's how I create 99% of the work I create is I find like-minded people who are looking themselves to express something creatively and challenge themselves. And I give them ownership over that department and I go, I'll give you my feedback, but I'm not gonna give you notes yeah. um, cause that's yours and that's your art and this is my art. And we're going to now make that together as a combined project. So I think what you need is people who are willing to give you advice, give you feedback, but then want to hold accountability to that, hold themselves accountable to joining you inside that journey. Because otherwise, they're they're just giving you advice that they don't have any intention of enacting. Yeah. <laughs> and they've probably never enacted themselves before. Yeah. So it's well-intentioned, but it's not actionable. Bro, that's so important uh, for people to hear, especially you saying... Uh, that you just got off of social media and didn't quote unquote take advantage of the wave or whatever to to make sure that you were healthy and it seems like you're still doing so much stuff. Um, you were talking a little bit earlier about a new VR thing you got going on. Uh, I want to hear about that. Is this something that you're? Are you traveling with that? Tell, tell me about the new VR thing. Yeah, so it's called Non-Player Character. It's a virtual reality musical. So I play an NPC of a fictional video game who sees the hero die, and I'm not programmed to process grief, so I don't know what just happened. So I turn to the audience to help navigate me through the five worlds, five stages of grief Oh wow! um, in this open world concept. And basically, it's fully improvised with four audience members who join me on stage in headset, and they're the players. And then the seated audience watches it all projected on a big screen. Um, And so you're getting that live theater element and that kind of Twitch let's play game element all in real time together in the same space. And it's fully improvised. I don't know what the audience is going to do every night. I am an NPC. So I just have to take what they say is true and go, Oh, that's how that works. Cool. Let's go over there. Um, And then we use the songs to regain control and subtly steer us towards a shape of a three act narrative. So that way we make sure that we tell a whole story regardless of what the audience does every night. That is crazy. Uh, Where, where are you? Like, uh, do you have a, like a tour schedule or something that's out or. So we basically, I am constantly every single day pinging different venues and locations typically around film festivals, tech conferences, academic conferences, uh, university systems. Um, we've played all over the world at this point, which is crazy and cool. Um, I've, I've performed live VR on three continents at this point. Wow. And right now we're trying to gear up for, we just got back from Texas A&M where we did a show. Um, and we're now gearing up for what would be hopefully like a summer sit down. Like what we want to really find is a venue that we can We've never sat down in one place for multiple weeks, churning audience out every single night. It, it's kind of a one night only limited engagement thing where mm. we don't know how much of what's working or isn't working is the one night only effect of yeah. like, we showed up, we got the people we got and we're out versus knowing what it's like to live inside of a show like this for a proper run. Yeah, kind of like that's a residency. That's right? what we haven't explored. Exactly. We haven't explored that yet. So that's what we're hoping to secure this summer. So if you've got a venue in LA, you bring us. are you trying to in LA in. or you, are you anywhere? Where, where are anywhere. you trying anywhere, man? You know what? There's a theater here. I'll, I'll, uh, I'll text you and send you information. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a great little theater. I think for something like that, it's actually close, um, to the Whitestone motion pictures offices and studio, Sweet. uh, in, in Georgia here. So I'll, uh, I'll give you that information, it, man. That would be amazing to see. Um, for sure. You, um, you mentioned this earlier, and I'd love to to end on this. You said uh, uh, people ask you all the time, "What was your first CD?" And you were like, "No, tape, vinyl." What <laughs> What was your first? Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna say tape. I think you're I think you're younger than than vinyl. Uh, that's very generous of you. I present very young. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm a bit of a vampire. Uh, the first vinyl was Simon and Garfunkel. All right. Uh, you buy that with your own money? 
uh, I I bought it with I adore you know the adorable money that your parents give you through air you know sure uh, what a chores and errands where it's like yeah you know I did I did not really earn this money like this is not, like this was a lovely change this was so my dad could teach me how to like spreadsheet and budget because I had to show everywhere I spent the five dollars oh yeah um, <laughs> <laughs> you know and show that I had tithed ten percent of it like yeah, yeah. you know like it was teaching <laughs> me how to human which was great yeah yeah um, but. First, my, first thing I ever bought, like with my own money properly, was the Ghostbusters two soundtrack. Oh, that's hot! Was that the Bobby Brown Ghostbusters uh, soundtrack? That was the Bobby Browns. That yeah. was that was cassette. Uh, and then the first CD at the same time, I bought Dookie with Green Day and Brian Adams, Summer '69. Mm-hmm. Nice, that's quality, dude. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Man, I can't tell you how important these kinds of conversations are for creative people, and I, I just appreciate you being willing to share so much of your story and experiences and all that sort of stuff. I think having conversations with people who do creativity, they do creative things for a living and have made a career out of it and hearing the real stories about just, you know, living it out day in and day out is super important and encouraging for people too. I think we make up a fairy tale that people are out there just, you know, either you're you've made it and you're buying Ferraris or you're like living in your parents' basement. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of joyful in between of finding out how to do creative things for a living and just enjoy the people around you and enjoy what you do. So I appreciate the time, Brendan. Well, I appreciate you signal boosting me and so, so many other artists. You have done so many of these conversations. Uh, It's quite a catalog and I'm just honored to be among them. Man, I appreciate it, dude. Have a good one. All right. You too. See, great conversation. Uh, I hope that you enjoyed it. I hope you feel inspired and encouraged. It's really, really hard out there to feel successful as a creative person. And when you talk to somebody like Brendan, who's been in it for so long and has made a career out of it, um, it's really encouraging. There's a lot of people out there who are just in the grind of creativity, but they're making a living doing something that they love. Uh, It may not be you know, a list actor or, you know, billboard top 10 musician or whatever, uh, that we may want to aspire to. Um, but we're out there doing the job, trying, trying to grow, trying to, um, you know, make a career out of this wild thing called creativity, however you, however you look at it. So anyway, I hope that was encouraging. Make sure to follow at Brendan A. Bradley on all of his social platforms and whatnot. And uh, make sure to check out his website, brendanabradley.com to see all the cool uh, stuff he was in. He's on IMDb and all that sort of stuff too. If you're more interested in his work, that's awesome. Uh, Go check it out. Thank you, Brendan, for being on the show, man. Uh, Make sure you're following at MyFi Podcast everywhere on socials. Make sure you can follow me as well. Uh, at Lee T. Baker and uh, make sure you subscribe. I also have a newsletter I love telling people about called MyFi Monday. It's a free newsletter. You can go to MyFiMonday.com to sign up for that and uh, you just get some encouragement in your inbox. Um, You can also check out LeeTBaker.com to sign up for that as well. That's kind of my catch-all site. There's stuff about the podcast on there. There's stuff about my creative coaching. Uh, I blog on there about the work that I'm doing and other things as well. So you can check out LeeTBaker.com and find everything you need there if you want to connect for some more resources and and, uh, just connect in in general. Shoot me a message. You know what I'm saying? Anyway, uh, until next time, you guys have a good one.